Hello and welcome back. Today I want to continue looking at the quarter wavelength impedance matching transformer by trying out some practical implementations. First step, how do you determine the actual transmission line length you need for your frequency of interest? The main thing to keep in mind here is that the quarter wavelength is not necessarily a physical dimension, but rather an electrical dimension. So if you're curious about that and much more, then keep watching. So what's the difference between electrical and physical length? I mean, is there a difference between the wavelength and the actual conductor or transmission line length? Well, before answering that, let's perform an experiment to check this. And to do that, we will be looking at the propagation delay, the time it takes for a signal to travel the length of a given transmission line. So what I have here is a piece of coax cable, 50 ohm coax, I already measured its length, it's 8.3 meters, and if we consider that the wave traveling through it is going at the speed of light, it should take about 27.6 nanoseconds to travel the whole length of the cable. So now to measure this, I prepared a signal generator, which would be inserting a square wave into the line, which we will also be measuring with the first channel of the oscilloscope. And then at the other end, we have the 50 ohm termination and the second channel of the oscilloscope to measure when the wave actually reaches this point. So if we turn on the generator, we see there is a delay in between the first and second channel, so it takes some time to get the signal from one end to the other. But if we actually look at the measured value, so we can do this using the cursors or relying on the automated measurement, and we can see that it takes about 42.2 nanoseconds for the square wave to travel the length of the line. That's a bit more than we were expecting. The actual difference in between the time that we're getting and the time that we were supposed to be getting is about 65-66%. Is this the time difference that you normally get? Let's perform another experiment to see that. So now what I did, I swapped the cable with a 10 meter long 75 ohm cable, this is what I had around, and again we're measuring the time it takes between when the signal enters and when it exits, Again, we have a 75 ohm termination, so that the wave has somewhere to go. And for a 10 meter cable, if the wave was traveling at the speed of light, we would expect a propagation delay of 33 nanoseconds. If we turn on the generator and we check, we can see that we're getting, again, a different amount of time. By using the cursors or by relying on the automated measurement, we can see that the time difference now is about 40 point 5 nanoseconds. So now, the time difference in between what we calculated and what we measured is about 80 to 81 percent, so again a different value. So what's going on? Well, this has to do with the speed of light, light being an electromagnetic wave for today's discussion. We all know this as a constant, C, and this value represents the speed of light in a vacuum. With our experiment, we did measure the speed at which the wave was traveling, but through our transmission line, and we were getting a completely different value. The reason being that the environment through which the wave was traveling, the internal structure of our coax cable, is not a vacuum, and thus has some other propagation properties. A wave traveling through an environment that has a higher than one relative dielectric constant will be traveling slower than the speed of light in a vacuum. And that is exactly what we were observing. Now, if you're using commercially available cables, the exact propagation speed is documented in the datasheet. So for the cable that I used in the experiment, this 40013 one, if you have a look at the parameters listed, so other than the characteristic impedance, we also have this propagation velocity being documented. So this is expressed in reference to C, the speed of light in a vacuum. And for this cable, it's 0.66. So if we use this value in our calculation, the measurement starts to make sense. And it's a similar story for the other cable, the 75 ohm one. If we have a look, we have a propagation velocity of 85%. So again, it's 85% in reference to the speed of light. So for commercial transmission lines, it's problem solved. You look up the propagation velocity in the datasheet, 
run some numbers, and you're done. But what about transmission lines that you make yourself? Like traces on a PCB. So to check this out, I prepared an experimental board that has two 50 ohm traces on it. And both of these are 2.82 meters long. Now the difference though is the layer on which they are rooted. So the first trace is on the outer layer, layer 1, and the second trace is on an inner layer, layer 3. So this is a strip line structure and the other one is a micro strip line. Now this is a four layer board and I use the other layers as reference planes. So for layer 3, layer 4 is a ground reference plane and for layer 1, the layer 2 is the ground reference plane. Now in this kind of application, the PCB manufacturers don't normally offer propagation velocity as part of the PCB description. So now let's observe the propagation delay in these traces on the PCB and start working from there. So I prepared the same setup as before, signal generator generating a square wave going into the transmission line, going out into a termination resistor, and then the two oscilloscope channels to measure when the signal enters and when it exits. And if we run this experiment, so turn on the generator and make a single capture, we can see that the time between when the signal entered and when it exited on the outer layer, so right now we're measuring on the microstrip line, is about 19.3 nanoseconds. If we now switch to the inner trace, the strip line one, which is the same length as this trace, and now we turn on the generator and rerun the experiment, so another single capture, we see we're getting a different time delay, which is 22.30 nanoseconds. So even though both of the traces have the exact same physical length, the time it takes for the signal to pass through the transmission line is different. Let's investigate why. To explain this difference, we need to again look where exactly the wave is traveling. In the coax cable, the entire wave was contained inside of the cable. So both the electric field and the magnetic field are contained between the outer foil and the inner conductor. And the wave is therefore traveling through the inner dielectric between these two structures. No part of the wave is outside of the cable. So no surprises here. However, for the two PCB structures, we have two different cases. With the strip line structure, the entire wave is contained inside of the PCB, traveling between the trace and the two ground layers. So this is where both the magnetic and electric fields are contained. And in this case, if we have a single type of environment through which the wave is traveling, so the dielectric is the same between all three of these layers, then we can call this environment to be a homogeneous structure. With the microstrip structure, we have a slightly different situation. So part of the field is contained within the PCB in the FR4 dielectric, part of it is outside in the air around the PCB. So since the wave now exists in two different environments, this is called an inhomogeneous structure. The global dielectric constant for the propagation environment for the strip line is therefore the PCB dielectric constant. This is a parameter that the manufacturers specify. However, for the microstrip, we have a smaller global dielectric constant, since this will be comprised of the PCB dielectric and the air dielectric, which has a relative value of 1. And using this dielectric constant, we have various formulas to calculate a more or less accurate propagation velocity. So we have a different formula for the strip line than for the microstrip line. Using the dielectric constant from the PCB manufacturer, 4.6 in this case, we can work out the propagation velocity for the strip line and for the microstrip line constants. Based on this, we can get some total propagation delays. So we should be getting 20.16 for the strip line, 17.09 for the microstrip. And these are fairly close values to the ones that we've observed during our measurements. So there's an almost constant two nanosecond difference between our calculation and the actual measurement. So the physical length of a transmission line does not matter unless you use it in conjunction with the propagation velocity. Using both of these, you can make a connection between the physical length and the electrical length, which somewhat refers to an equivalent physical length, which creates the same time delay in the signal, but in a vacuum.
Now, the electrical length is usually expressed in wavelengths or phase degrees for a specific frequency. So final thing to do is see for what frequency our trace is a quarter wavelength. So knowing both the frequency and the propagation velocity, we can work out how long the transmission line needs to be. Or if we have a given length of line, using this length and the propagation velocity, we can work out the frequency for which this line is a quarter wavelength. Or we can get to this frequency based on the propagation delay, if we have this value. For the transmission lines that we measure today, using the propagation delay, these are the quarter wavelength frequencies that we should see. So now it's time to verify this and both the impedance transformation behavior of some of these lines. The exact method of measurement that I will be using today is to observe the impedance of the transmission line from the signal source side. So we can quickly look at this measurement in the circuit simulator. For that I prepared a basic simulation with a transmission line and an end load that has a different impedance than the line. And to perform the measurement, I'm using the .NET statement. So when I run the simulation, we can add the trace with the input side impedance. So impedance seen from the signal source side and just change to linear. And we can see that the impedance seen from the signal source side at the quarter wavelength frequency. So for a propagation delay of 25 nanoseconds, it's 10 megahertz. We see 100 ohms which is the impedance according to the quarter wavelength transformation formula. So at this particular frequency, we also have a zero degree phase shift and the purely resistive load has been turned into a purely resistive impedance of different value. And the similar phenomenon is happening at other higher frequency multiples. To perform this measurement, I will be using the nano VNA set into impedance measurement mode on the first port. So I'm outputting the absolute impedance on the one hand and on the other the phase shift. And I've already calibrated it using this length of cable on this 1 MHz to 150 MHz frequency span. So let's start off with a quick sanity check and measure a 50 ohm termination resistor. If we connect this into the device, we can see that the impedance is perfectly flat, so a perfect 50 ohm straight line. And there's a bit of phase shift, maybe because of the length of the cable. So no major surprises so far. Next, let's add an extra bit of transmission line in series with the 50 ohm termination, specifically the PCB transmission line that we've prepared. So this was designed to have 50 ohms of impedance. So we should still get a flat response if we insert this in between the cable and the termination resistor. So now I've connected the outer layer, so the microstrip line. And if we look onto the measurement, we can see it's almost 50 ohms, so very small deviations. And there's a bit of a wiggle in the response. So it's not a perfectly flat higher or lower value. It's oscillating up and down. And we can also see this in the phase measurement. We have some sort of phase variation. So what this is telling us is that our 50 ohm transmission line is not exactly 50 ohms. There's a bit of a variation in it, which is causing us our impedance mismatch. And the transmission line is transforming the end impedance into some other value based on its length. Now, it's perfectly normal for a transmission line to not have exactly the value that you've designed. So typically about 10% of tolerance is common with PCB made transmission lines. So this result is perfectly normal. Next, we can more accurately check the quarter wavelength frequency of this transmission line by doing an extreme impedance transformation. So we can replace our 50 ohm termination with a short circuit cap. When we do this, the short circuit will be seen as an open circuit at the beginning of the line at our quarter wavelength frequency. So if we now use our cursor, also look at the point where phase goes through zero, so here we're not seeing an infinite impedance, we see about 500 ohms, but that's close enough. This is first occurring at 13.9 megahertz. So this is in line with the propagation delay that we've measured earlier. We can also see that this peak impedance, so this open circuit that we're measuring, is not just occurring at this frequency. We can also see it at about 
40.8 MHz, which is three times the previous frequency, 67.1 MHz, and so on. So this peak impedance is being observed at higher frequency multiples as expected from the simulation. We can of course observe a similar behavior if we leave the line open. So right now there's nothing at the end of the line, so at our quarter wavelength frequency, rather than seeing an open circuit, the actual open circuit that we have, we're seeing a short circuit. So a very small impedance in this case. So right now I left the cursor exactly where it was before, and we can see that it is at a minimum impedance value. So it's not really zero, it's slightly higher, so at this 67 megahertz, it's about 13.2 ohms. And if we go to the very first frequency, the 13.2 one, we see we're getting about 5.6 ohms. So we're not getting zero because this is a real life lossy transmission line. And this five ohms is approximately the series resistance of the three meter long trace that I have on the board. Finally, we can do a clearly defined impedance transformation. So rather than going for open circuits or short circuits, we can start with a 25 ohm load. So these are two 50 ohm terminations in parallel. If we pass this through a 50 ohm transmission line, we should be seeing 100 ohms at the beginning. And well, if we do this, or less the same frequency that we've measured before, 12.2, the frequency is slightly changed because the length has been changed. And here we are seeing 97.8 ohms, so almost the 100 ohms that we are supposed to be getting. And then at higher frequencies, we still see these impedance peaks, but they're dropping as frequency increases. So we're not getting the same 100 ohms over the entire frequency span because, well, this is a real life lossy line. So as frequency increases, the behavior will be less and less the value that we were expecting from the calculations. We can now look at two extreme cases with this behavior, starting off with the trace on the inner layer. So the strip line trace, this is also a 50 ohm trace on this board, but what makes it different from the outer layer microstrip line is that the copper thickness on inner layers is usually thinner. This makes the outer layer have about 5 ohms of DC resistance, whereas the inner layer has about 16 ohms. So if you now connect the VNA to this trace with the same 25 ohms at the end, we see the same impedance transformation at a slightly different frequency, since it has a different propagation delay, but we see we're no longer getting the 100 ohms, we're only getting about 88, and the impedance value quickly drops off as frequency increases. So the more lossy the line is, the worse the behavior that you will get out of it. The other extreme case that we can look at is the commercially available 50 ohm coax cable. So even though this is a much longer structure, it has far lower resistance because of the way in which it was built. So I already attached the 25 ohms to the end of it. And if we now connect it to the VNA, Again, we're getting different frequencies because of the different propagation delay, but we're getting much closer to the 100 ohms, and we can see this value being far more stable as frequency increases. So the lower loss cable is giving a far more predictable result over a wider frequency span. Although PCB-based transmission lines are used in practice, they are usually kept relatively short to reduce the signal losses. And if the use case requires especially good performance, special PCB materials can be used. So rather than going for the typical FR4, you have lower loss ceramic substrates that can be used in higher performance devices. It's also important to remember that the length of the transmission line that you're calculating is not the physical length unless you take into account the propagation velocity in the environment around the transmission line, so the dielectric around it. This principle applies not just to transmission lines, but any other structure where the length is somewhat related to the frequency of work, like when designing antennas. So whenever you need a quarter wavelength impedance transformer, these principles need to be kept in mind to get some good results. And with that said, hope you got some useful information out of this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to get updated with all my videos and see you next time. Bye bye.